when, what the research that Kohler did and others showed, if you take time and take any nutrient, uh, whether it be chlorophyll, a protein, a thiamine, uh, it's one of the amino acids, but they all follow basically the same curve. If you start here, this being the time of, of germination of the seed, and this being like in days, and going out here, we'll look at spring wheat, uh, because with winter wheat, it, I'll, I'll show you the difference, but if we're looking at spring wheat, say about 45 days on an average, uh, the nutrient level starts going up in the plant as those sugars are converted to more complex nutrients. And then it reaches a peak level right about here. And this is the joining stage. At this point, uh, down in the root, the, the uh, plant has developed an embryo of grain, uh, an ovule, really. It hasn't been fertilized yet. But if, if, you, if you opened up the root, you'd see it. And it's a, uh, smaller than the pinhead. But if you look at it very closely, you'll see all, it'll look just like a miniature shaft. You've seen a shaft of wheat, you know on the end of the stalk. It looked like that, but it's only about the size of pinhead. At that stage, when it reaches its absolute peak and the, and the climate and weather is just right, the plant starts, uh, you can start looking at hour after hour, really, and that ovule is moving up inside the stalk and uh, is, is coming up. And we've had wheat that uh, the ovule, average place of the ovule was right at ground level when we started harvesting, and by afternoon it was up two inches above that. It goes that quickly. So at this stage, it drops very, very quickly. How many days is that? This is on an average of 45 days for spring wheat. To the first joint? To the joining stage, uh huh? And then, then if you're looking at a chart for winter wheat, you would have an area in here that would be flat for probably about 150 days during the cold of winter. And then it starts back up again. So with winter wheat, you're really talking about 210 days uh, before it reaches the joining stage. Sear grass is much more concentrated in, in green food nutrients than other grasses. It's the most, con because of this joining stage, this slow growth and the, the way sear grass is doing it. At this stage, not at this stage where most people grow it in trade, but this stage where, where it's at the joining stage, it's much, much richer than other grasses and nutrients. All the products that we sell are, are wheatgrass harvested at the joining stage. It's, we have a, a, an average field, take, we have about a four day period that we, we consider to be parameters. Uh, and it would be, you know, somewhere in like in here. We feel like, you know, we want to get as close as possible to the joining stage. Now, if the weather's real cool, sometimes that can be extended for about a week. You know, it, is, it won't, it won't, the ovule doesn't move very fast, but it starts turning warm, that ovule just shoots mm -hmm. up. The nauseous, nauseousness that people have with trade-grown wheatgrass is nothing to do with wheatgrass at all. It's, it's, it has to do with the way it's grown under un, very unnatural conditions, uh, conditions that really aren't, set up for the wheat plant. When it's grown naturally, when it's harvested at the joining stage, after a long winter of growth or a long spring of growth, it's very powerful. People will come and they'll drink uh, eight ounces of it and all they do is just feel real good. You know? If you took a fresh, some wheatgrass juice grown in Kansas and harvested at the joining stage, took an ounce of it and compared it with an ounce of wheatgrass grown under artificial conditions or trade grown wheatgrass, you would find at least four times the nutrient level to begin with. And it could be as much as 10 times the nutrient level if you're looking at chlorophyll, um, beta carotene, and so on. Uh, it's much darker green. The leaves are much fleshier. It has a much higher nutrient level. We are the only pines, when I say we, are the only company that I know of right now in the natural food store that does nitrogen packing uh, of our green food products. So the, when we dehydrate the product, as soon as it's dehydrated, it's put immediately into a freezer. We only take it out of the freezer to make it into tablets and put it into bottles. And then as soon as it goes in the bottles, it's put into nitrogen. So when you get the bottle, from a theoretical point of view, it's still as fresh as the day it was dehydrated. Right, After you open it, you know, you've got um, a very slow uh, process of, of decline. But because of the fact that most green foods that you get have been in air for maybe a year or two before they get to the health food store, they probably haven't been kept in a freezer. Uh, you really don't need to worry about it like you would some other green food. It, six months in the refrigerator, you're not going to have very, a very significant loss. And it's a very ec economical food. People can actually save money on their food budget by doing this. Uh, 20 or 30 tablets a day would be equal to eating uh, several large servings of green vegetables. Uh, I don't think people should cut green vegetables out of their diets, but they could cut out things like pastries and you know, junk and candy bars and stuff like that and replace that kind of food with this, and they'll actually save, spend less on their food budget. Well, thank you all for, uh, for being here.